powers that we have as humans, let alone as like a group of people with a deep-rooted culture, sometimes we sell ourselves short or become mentally complacent. If we make that jump, we become a... Welcome back with the Power Perception Podcast. It is your host, Lange Hola. Um, today we're being joined by uh, one of my uh, youth leaders growing up, but he's been um, a mentor and family member and friend to a lot of people around the valley, the one and only Shone Havili. Uh, welcome, man. Thanks, Lange. Appreciate you having me. Big fan. So, um, with the podcast, uh, I think you already know the the first thing is first. Um, we cover sports, and I believe in the sport of football, it's a humbling sport, right? So, um, I think the first question I want to ask you is, when's the first time you got got playing the sport of football? Good question. It's one of my favorite ones that I've seen you add with uh, previous guests. Uh, other than the time that uh, I snuck back into my room, um, tippy-toed to turn on the lights, and my dad was sitting on the bed. Uh, <laughs> Football-wise... Um, High school, I, I'll share two. One was in high school. Uh, first varsity game, I was playing kickoff against West High School. Um, Ten yards as, as I was running downfield. I uh, just got side-blinded by uh, a guy named Ben Fanua. Uh, rest in peace. Feet uh, hit the sky, back hit the ground, and uh, that was my welcoming to varsity football. Uh, another experience was in college, uh, playing at Texas Tech. Uh, we were playing at UT. Uh, Vince Young was the quarterback, Cedric Benson was the running back, and uh, I was chasing down Cedric Benson uh, on an outside run and uh, wasn't keeping my head on a swivel, and Roy Williams got me, and uh, uh, just like Ben Fonua did. And so both of those were really tough experiences, extremely humbling. Man, um, kind of makes me happy to know that my Longhorns introduced <laughs> you to uh, Texas football down in the South. Oh, that's that's awesome. So um, I kind of want to dive in. Uh, how did how did you get into the sport of football? Yeah, man. You know, my dad migrated over from Tonga um, two years before I was born, and uh, he was a track and uh, a rugby player. And so naturally, um, he had taught me as best as he could um, how to run the ball like a rugby player. And so I had the ball vertically. Um, a lot of times I was catching it with my body. And then he got me enrolled in, in Little League as an 11-year-old. Um, didn't know about the the the, uh, the weight limits in Utah. So my first year I was an X-Men. Um, had a good time and then uh, made weight every year from, from then. Um, but it just, it was interesting. Football just kind of came natural. Um, and I don't know if it was because I was Tongan or because, you know, it was something I inherited from my dad. Oh, awesome, man. Um, so uh, you ended up going to high school at, at East. Uh, I think we talked previous and you had mentioned how um, East wasn't that good of a high school football team at that time as, as it is now and being a powerhouse. But um, you guys kind of made a, a collective effort as boys in the community. It's like, let's put East High School on the map. How How's that going through high school? Yeah. Man, West was the powerhouse. West was the Bingham, uh, the East, the Tempview, now Orem, uh, Corner Canyon of, of this day. Um, and so back then, I think East maybe had five years in a row where they hadn't won a game. And they were highlighted in Sports Illustrated as the worst high school team in the country. Um, at the time, there were a, a bunch of us young guys coming up in my age group. Uh, Jason Kafusi was living in the neighborhood, but he went to Olympus. Shone Poha was headed to judge. Uh, and there were a couple of us, you know, Samu, Kutu, and Stani, and Lani Afu, and Chris Hola, and, and just a bunch in that age group that we just wanted to really make a difference. And so we made a commitment um, that we all go to East and see what we could do. And uh, the first year wasn't great, but the second year we ended up turning the program around and made it to the state championship and continue to make it to the state championship every every year thereafter while we were there. So you, you were part of the, what was it, the 96 team? Yes. And so uh, you kind of, you were part of the running back lineage of East High School. You know, you, you guys had a lot of prominent running backs coming through the ranks. Um, just kind of put that in perspective. You know, you, you see all these kids come through and now they have the tradition of wearing the number two jerseys. Like such a big deal at East High School. Um, 
Yeah, just put that in perspective, the running back position is high school. Yeah, man. I think there were quite a few that followed before me. Um, and after me, I mean, there was Fui Vacapuna, uh, Asi Tuakoi, uh, the Masiva brothers. And then you even, you know, uh, come to the modern day where Jalen Warren and, um, and Ula. Uh, it was just a tradition, you know, and uh, it, it was a different kind of offense. But from the neighborhood, it's interesting. We ran a similar offense, not option, uh, but it was a super run heavy offense, which kind of boded well for the kids that come out of Glendale. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's been a good fraternity to be a part of. And I know other schools have the same, but, you know, we pride ourselves in having a really strong group. I, I remember like coming to Utah and um, I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, in the state of Texas where I grew up in at Ulysses Trinity, I think my whole entire childhood watching Trinity grow or like play football, I probably seen one running back the whole entire time I was there. Right. And it was kind of like a sense of pride for me to see like, man, like they have a lineage of running backs where we can let alone just probably get one in. And um, it's, it's crazy to see like how um, when the number two jersey has been passed on, like now that's their number nowadays. It's uh, <clears throat> it's like a rite of passage, like whoever does don that jersey is usually the best player on the team. And so that's that's kind of cool how like we kind of put ourselves out there as people. Um, so you you go from high school, you win a state championship. Um, let's talk about uh, how your recruiting process. Um, who were the schools that were interested in you? Yeah, it was fun at the time. Uh, the local schools, BYU and Utah, Utah State. Um, the schools back in the late 90s that were really good were Washington, Colorado, Nebraska uh, was getting recruited by all of them as well. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun, interesting process. I mean, ghetto kid, getting to go on these recruiting trips with my mom and dad and uh, having a chance to sit down and eat lobster tail and, and uh, steak when, uh, you know, the one thing that we would enjoy most probably was chuck or or maybe even D's. Uh, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was quite the experience, and I'm glad that my parents were able to experience that with me. You know, Nebraska was a powerhouse at the time. They ran an option offense. Mm-hmm. Um, they had Lawrence Phillips and then a guy named Thunder Collins that had followed shortly thereafter. Uh, I, Rick Neuheisel was coaching at, at Washington. Um, Colorado had uh, kind of a stable of Heisman-type running backs. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it came down to BYU, Utah. You know, my parents, they weren't rich. My dad never made more than, you know, I think $47,000 a year. And so there was no way that they would be able to afford to watch me anywhere outside of the local schools. And so, funny story, um, when it came down to the decision, uh, I, I come from a, a very strong Christian family. Um, uh, and my parents were raised me in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so one of the biggest things is we always want to include, you know, the Lord in our decisions. And so my dad had me pray, uh, and fast for a decision. Now my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time had already, um, enrolled and was committed to go to, to the university of Utah. So my dad kind of blocked out all outside communication and, uh, locked me in a room for two days, had me pray and fast. And I came out. And uh, the answer that I told him wasn't the answer that uh, my dad wanted. And so my dad told me, hey, go back in the room until Heavenly Father says BYU. And uh, I ended up signing with BYU uh, myself in Reno, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, man. Uh, that's the tongue and way of free agency, I'll tell you that. Man, it was funny because I remember Reno t- saying like a very similar story to when he was coming out of high school. And he was talking about, yeah, you know, I was going through all these schools and this is and that and then um my mom was just like yeah you're going to BYU and then he was telling me later down the line she's like well I knew BYU was going to be the place that kind of whipped you back into shape and <laughs> uh, I think that came to fruition so um you ended up committing to to BYU um so you end up going on a mission right and so and so yeah, yeah, dive no, it's, it's, it's kind of cool how myself and Reno's stories intertwined. Mm-hmm. Um, we were both the top two recruits. Uh, neither one of us, you know, uh, were planning on going that direction. They saved that last uh, recruiting trip for us both. And it was kind of a, a decision that our parents had both made. And it was it was great for him. Uh, and I think it would have been great for me. 
Uh, academically, I didn't do well my senior year. And so I was there that summer training um, and things didn't pan out. So I decided that I was going to go on on a mission. And so I filed my papers, uh, ended up getting a mission call uh, to go to New York City. Um, and between the time that I had received my mission call and uh, left on my mission, I was involved in some gang activity. And uh, I didn't tell anyone. There wasn't any ecclesiastical interviews between that time and when I left. And uh, um, first and foremost, well, let me let me be clear. Uh, I'm not a victim. Right. I made some decisions that today I still very much regret. Um, I don't broadcast um, my background to, to many people. But if there's an opportunity to be able to share my experiences where people can learn, um, I, I'm more than open to, to be able to share those. Uh, I ended up going on my mission. Uh, I was out there for a year and a half. And then I was implicated in, in the mastermind of, of uh, a retaliation to a drive-by. And so I was extradited, extradited back home uh, to serve time, lost my scholarship at BYU, and uh, kind of changed the pathway of my life forever from there. We, we talked previously a little about, bit how, about how um, oftentimes when you, you make a, a decision like that, it kind of alters the path that you're you're going to be on um and then you, you brought up how you know you know for for you like sports had been such an inspiration like this is how I was gonna probably provide for my family and then it ended up opening your eyes to new doors right and so um kind of dive in into um after all that happened and then trying to get reacclimated to society I guess it was tough, man. I hit rock bottom. Um, essentially, I ended up getting convicted of a first degree felony. I ended up doing time. Um, made the best of my situation while I was in there. It's, it's interesting because the way that I like to look at life is life is, is kind of like a card game, right? Um, we're judged by the way that we play those cards. And all of us are dealt different cards. I had really good cards, but I played one bad card. And that really dictated the rest of the game for me. Um, so I lost my scholarship to BYU um, uh, as I was locked up. Uh, my parents and my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, were, were two of the only ones that visited me. Uh, the only ones outside of them were uh, my New York City Mission President, uh, Lysa Tuyaki and Coach McBride, uh, and an uncle of mine, uh, Muli uh, but, but I But I had to be very, very selective uh, only because I only got one visit per week, right? And I wanted to make sure that it was you know, something that was uplifting. Well, anyways, long story short, I paid my debt to society, uh, came out and I transferred to Utah. Um, but because of the situation, I wasn't allowed to play right away. So I had to prove myself for an entire year academically. And, uh, I ended up doing that, uh, a week before the first game. Uh, I found out that I was kicked off the football team, uh, a decision that was made by the athletic director, unbeknownst to coach McBride and, and the staff there. Uh, so I picked up my pieces, moved my newly married wife. I think we were married probably only for about three months to Los Angeles to go to a junior college at El Camino. And so went through the whole recruiting process again. Again, I joined the season late there, uh, only played a couple games. Uh, first game it was a really good one and was able to get recruited, narrowed my decision to Fresno State and Texas Tech. And that's how I ended up at Texas Tech. Robert and I was there. Mike Leach was there. And so I really trusted the opportunity to go there. Uh, didn't have a stellar career. I mean, keep in mind, it served some time, went on a mission. Um, the offense wasn't the best fit for a big running back like me, but I was grateful for the opportunity to get a free education and play in the Big 12. So you get the opportunity to, to play in the Big 12. I think um, one of the hardest decisions is probably, you know, being out there on your own, just you, your wife, and just focusing in on your family. Um, I remember as a, um, I want to say I was a teacher in the youth. Um, you were speaking one Sunday and you brought up how um, your dad had came and helped you guys move all your stuff to to Texas. And um, whenever he went back, on his way back, um, you were expecting, you know, he's going to help you out with a little bit of something. And um, it was kind of like his wake up call to you, like, hey, you're your father now, your dad now or you're a husband now. So you, you got to 
kind of take care of your own. How was that experience for you being in Texas? Man, that was extremely humbling. Uh, my dad flew out to Los Angeles, helped me drive my moving truck all the way to Lubbock, Texas. Um, poor, poor student, didn't have anything. And the two things that my dad had always taught us growing up is, number one, I need you to be independent. And number two, I need you to make a difference in the community. And so while we were in California, um, I won't lie, him and my mom really helped. Like if we needed a car payment, uh, you know, they would be able to to provide because it was super expensive. So I assumed that I was going to get the same kind of support in Lubbock. Uh, but as we went to the airport, you know, I told dad, I'm like, hey, I have no more money. Can I have some money? And uh, tearfully, my dad said, no, like, I can't do this anymore. You have to figure this out. And uh, it was definitely a rude awakening. Um, from that point on, my wife and I did our best to make sure that uh, we could we could provide. And it was probably the best learning experience from that point on as a young couple. And uh, we've been able to do that ever since. Man, uh, I remember there was a story you shared about your dad. Um, I think it was, uh, I want to say, one of the things that kind of like taught you to be humble was, um, you know, your dad would go and work long hours and then come back home at night. And uh, when your mom would have the dinner table set for, you know, you guys' big family, um your dad would wait until everyone was done eating to actually eat. Right. And so like, these are kind of the things that are like, man, like this is really humbling for us as we get older to see like the sacrifices that our parents have made to kind of, you know, like when no one was really in your corner, that was the one guy who was kind of always there. And yeah. it's kind of nice to know that you always have someone to back you up. Yeah. I mean, that's an experience I'll never forget. Um, like I said, I'm the oldest of eight kids. Uh, my mom stayed home to really just kind of manage and, and keep the fort steady for all eight kids. My dad uh, drove the UTA bus, the school bus, the bus, taxi. He'd have three or four jobs at any given time to, to support our family. And my wife, uh, my mom uh, was super awesome to stay home. Uh, but we didn't have much, you know, and uh, I didn't notice it until I got older um, that all of us would eat. And they would wait until we went to sleep to basically um, clean up the scraps. And so I'm eternally grateful. And that's something that I think a lot of our Pacific Islander kids don't understand are the sacrifices that our parents make on behalf of their children. And that's something I'm forever grateful for. Yeah. Like, I remember um, whenever I think we first moved here to Utah, um, like my my parents are like so independent, you know, and so we were staying with um, our family in West Valley, uh, President Kinikini and them, and um, they felt so uncomfortable being taken care of by another family that within, I, I want to say two or three weeks, um, we moved out of their home into a little apartment, and it was a two-bedroom apartment for, I want to say, five kids, right? And so my sister shared a room and then me and my little brothers, um, there was one couch we had and that's all the money we had at the time to, to provide for our home. And so what ended up happening was, you know, um, me, Joe and Mata, we would take turns on who got to sleep on the couch every single night. <laughs> me being the big brother, you know, um, I was like, well, you guys are going to sleep on the floor every night. And so, um, it's just kind of crazy to see, like, you, you don't know you're struggling until after the fact that it's kind of happened and you've kind of reflected on your life. 
and it's it's kind of been cool though because like i remember talking to my little brother when he came home from his mission and he was sharing about how um it's like man you know one of the the biggest reasons why i feel like i work so hard was i remember those times where like um it's like there were people from the sandy fourth ward who were like dropping off food to our house and then he's like man and like at the time like you think like oh like dang free food this is awesome but like what that really meant was like you know we were going through a tough stretch and you know people were reaching out to help us and i think that's kind of the reason why like our family is like so close to to that sandy fourth ward and so especially thank you huge thank you to that ward man i think uh, there will always be a, a special place in my heart in my family's heart for those guys and that's kind of how we first were introduced i guess so <clears throat> you go to texas tech and you end up playing football over there um kind of go into uh um, football wasn't actually the the point or the the career path you were actually going to choose um what was your major while you were there and um, how did you come to that decision to choosing your job right now? Yeah, and um, when I was there, obviously the hopes and dreams were still to try to make it to the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, I got there uh, my sophomore year after playing my freshman at, at El Camino College. Uh, actually had a chance to play significant time as a running back the first two games. Uh, but as you can imagine, as a 245, 250-pound tailback in a Mike Leach offense, <laughs> it was kind of like a sixth or seventh lineman. Um, and so I had actually asked Coach Leach and uh, Coach and I if it was okay if I switched to defense. And uh, so I ended up playing defense, was going to switch to nose guard. Coincidentally, those first two games we played, our non-conference games, uh, was first game was against NC State, and they had a quarterback named Phillip Rivers, and they had a running back named T.A. McClendon. And the very next non-conference game that we had right after that uh, was Ole Miss, and their quarterback was Eli Manning. And so I had the opportunity because there was a vacancy to, to start nose guard. I'd never put my hand on the ground uh, those two games. And as you can imagine, uh, playing against the NC States and the Ole Misses SEC football, having never played D tackle in my life, as soon as the offensive lineman would get a hold of me, it was over. Like I, I wasn't skilled enough as much as, you know, they saw that I ran the ball fairly viciously and uh, tried to be as violent as I possibly could. Um, but that's, I mean, that, I, I didn't have the most stellar career. Uh, but I, but I, you know, played the roles that they wanted me to play, um, and you know, was grateful for a free education. Uh, enjoyed my two years there. Uh, my senior year, Coach Ron McBride, who was my coach at the University of Utah, and, and spent some time visiting me when I was locked up, um, was actually at Kentucky for two years. Those first two years, and then he got the head job at Weber State, and so I just decided, hey, we both ended up, you know, leaving Utah. Uh, on terms that we weren't happy with. And so I figured, you know, it might be an opportunity for me to go play running back again and uh, play under Coach Ron McBride. So I transferred. I graduated early and I transferred. Um, and uh, it was interesting because, you know, I had a really good offseason and then a week before the first game. I mean, talk about um, challenges or, or things that you have to overcome. You know, I, I lost my scholarship, got locked up. I had to, I got kicked off of University of Utah's football team. You know, I thought that things were going to be, uh, there was some light at the end of the tunnel. And then a week before the first game, I was running the ball routinely, like I had done ever since Little League. Um, had some contact with the linebacker. I blinked and I opened my eye and uh, I couldn't see. Um, and I just thought there was something in there. Long story short, they sent me to the hospital and I had a stroke wow. at 25 years old. And so that was uh, essentially the end of my career. Um, and my wife and I felt bad for ourselves for about three days because we had such high hopes that football was going to be the vehicle. Uh, and then we decided that, it, you know, I had a degree and it was time to kind of get into the workforce and dust myself off and support, uh, my two kids, Destiny and Stan at the time. And so, but it was difficult because keep in mind, I'm a first degree convicted felon. And so the job market wasn't, uh, wasn't very favorable at that time. And so that, that took me to that point in my life. Man, um, I talk, I ask athletes a lot, you know, um, when, when tragedy strikes in a sense and, and your, your dreams are kind of shot down, um, 
like how long were you bitter right and so um i think the 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 coolest stories are the ones who kind of you know you know who can really admit like you know they've been bitter for for like a few days and then finally just told themselves you like you know um this didn't happen for me maybe god has another plan and so like i've talked to like Hiva Lutui, he had a very similar experience. Um, they're in spring practice. He's supposed to start his senior year. He's been waiting for guys who have been going to the NFL in front of him all this time. And then, boom, torn ACL on a day they weren't supposed to be padded up. Someone hit the back of his knee and it just snapped. Um, I think Fisi Moleni, same thing. Or he, and then, like, I kind of see, like, the, the rep, like, all these guys kind of going through through this and what's crazy to me is like um there's always something on the back end that's probably just as fulfilling if not more you know and uh it's kind of like you're so grateful for all the people who kind of put you in place to be where you're at today so let's kind of dive in you you brought up um you you got into the workforce um what um field are you actually a part of and I'm going into as of right now yeah let me backtrack on that point really quickly because you said something that was really interesting about Hiva and Fisi Um, you've had some really cool guests you know Reno and Star you know phenomenal athletic success stories right Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think there's a reoccurring theme um, with Pacific Islanders within our ancestors within our DNA I think a lot of people look at uh, Pacific Islanders as just a very warrioristic culture um you know they see the war dances they see the hakas they see that we're physically intimidating but but very light on our feet um but what i think they neglect to realize is that our people are very uh brilliant right our our ancestors would navigate the open seas by the constellation the stars the wind um the currents um but but one thing that i i've also heard of is that anytime they would go to war as soon as they would land on an island, the first thing that they would do is they'd burn their canoes. And the reason why is there is no way that they're coming off that island unless they conquer that island. And so when you talk about the stories of, of Fisi and Hiva and myself, um, we had the same intention that Star and Reno and Kite did to excel you know, in, in our athletic careers, but it didn't happen. But luckily we had burned our canoes. So whatever the path was, is our focus is we were going to use what we were given, our intellect, to conquer that island, even though the outcome wasn't what we initially anticipated. And so um, being a a convicted felon, it was difficult for me to find work, right? Um, Before my mission, I worked as a mover. I worked uh, in in clerical roles at law firms. And man, nobody would touch me with a a 10-foot pole. I found an industry, it was a a real estate and stock investment education industry uh, where it was very high pressure. Um, But as long as you could uh, speak well and you could hustle, right? And I figured that was just my my foot in the door, even though I had a degree in human development and family studies slash psychology, I couldn't find field of work there. So I actually started uh, selling investment education for about three years and I did really, really well there. Um, so I, I didn't start in tech, which is what I do now. Uh, but in 09, um, there was a, a big acquisition where Adobe is based in San Jose and they acquired a company in, in, uh, Utah County called Omniture for $2 billion. And I had a friend that was working there at the time. Uh, and he made some really good, good coin in the acquisition. So I was like, dang, I'd be very, very interested to, to maybe, you know, dip my toe in the water in tech. But, but, but there was a fork in the road because I always wanted to practice law. Uh, but I knew if I ended up going to law school, the risk was is that as a convicted felon, I wouldn't pass the bar. And so um, I, I found out that Adobe was hiring. And so I ended up going interviewing for, for a position there. Um, it's an interesting story. And sorry, I know this is a long answer. No. Um, but I found out that they were hiring for an entry-level sales role. Um, and there were about... 900 applicants for three open heads and it was an interview experience like I've never had before meaning that stepping into an interview it's normally one-on-one there was a panel 
of three directors and a VP uh, in this boardroom. And so, uh, as you can imagine, I was probably on the tail end of these interviews and, and the two that I remember most vividly uh, is Jason Coop uh, and a guy named Don Cash. He was the VP, Jason Coop was a director and there were a couple other directors there. But the, what was communicated to me was uh, the uphill battle that I would have. You know, there are hundreds of applicants, there are only a couple roles. We're actually just going through these interviews to find what's wrong with candidates so that we can, you know, hurry through this process. And I had an epiphany and I'd never, it wasn't my intention. And I said something that I can't believe I said, uh, but really kind of changed uh, the momentum of, of that interview. And I says, well, if you're looking for something wrong, you're going to find more wrong in me than anyone else. And so the room kind of went quiet and they're like, okay, well, we've inter interviewed hundreds of candidates. What, what could we find in you that we haven't found in anyone else? And I said, well, first and foremost, I'm a first degree convicted felon. And the room went completely silent and they didn't ask any questions. And so I just felt that it was my job from that point was to tell my story. And so for about 30, 30 minutes, I told my story from beginning to end. And after that point, they went straight up to San Jose to executive leadership and got an approval for me to get hired. And that was nine years ago. And since then, I haven't had to look back. So it's been the biggest blessing in my life. I think there there's a lot to be said with um, with things that we can often be insecure with, you know, things that we look at as, you know, mistakes in our past. But when we kind of own them, right, because at the end of the day, they, they kind of shape who we are and guide us on the path to where we're ever going to be. Um, it could honestly be the deciding factor of, whether you make it or not in terms of where your goals are going to be. And so I think just just hearing that story, um, that probably resonates with a lot of, you know, not only our people, but people all around the world. Um, I know you're involved with, um, in uh, an organization that um, advocates for people who um, are given second chances, right? Um, kind of talk to maybe the relief you might have had after that moment we're like dang like because I kind of shared my story um these guys gave me an opportunity yeah um you mentioned early on about um hitting these things head on right and uh I actually learned that early when I was at the University of Utah um there was a uh, a lady, her name is Fahina Tabake Basi, uh, and she was uh, kind of helping the Pacific Islander students there. And I, as I was going through the, the things that I was going through at the University of Utah and trying to fight to stay there before I went to El Camino College, um, in every conversation, I apologized um, for who I was, right? And she told me not to apologize because that's part of my story, but leverage that, right, to your benefit. And so that's one of the biggest things is, uh, yes, uh, one of my biggest focuses, so I'm, I'm a board member for the Utah Polynesian Professionals um, and some amazing people, very powerful, powerful Pacific Islanders in tech and in insurance and marketing uh, that sit on these boards. And my prim primary focus is I, I try to help other people that have blemishes on their records, uh, Pacific Islanders, women, people of diversity to find meaningful, you know, roles and opportunities and so i don't get paid to do this uh and bless my wife's heart because she lets me do this at night when i have free time but i'm coaching these people on how to interview on how to share these things on the front end because a lot of times i mean keep in mind you don't want to go through the entire process and at the end they find out that you did something um what i've learned and what i teach these guys is hey share it on the front end so that they know that you're honest and then they can basically make a decision based on your body of work having known that and knowing that you have been completely honest and it has been it has been a, a phenomenal experience for me to be able to see how that's impacted a lot of people's lives man that's that's so awesome i think there's a lot to be said when it comes to you know especially our community it's always been one that um is so giving right especially whenever we have someone who's maybe coming into an industry, coming into um, a line of work that, you know, there there are other Polynesians who are already currently there. Um, there's always a sense of um, camaraderie, family, 
type of atmosphere. And so um, I always say this in all of my interviews. It's nice to know that we take care of our own. And um, I remember Star brought up like whenever he was coming through the ranks, like Shane Pooha, it's like anytime he had questions in terms of like schematics and schemes and um, like just football questions, like Shane was always down to answer those questions. And then ha Haloti, he was telling me like the thing with Haloti, he's like, you no, know, he was so locked in with those guys in in Baltimore, like he he never really wanted to talk football and all the things he wanted to focus on were um, outside of football, right? And so how to take care of your body, things you should be spending your money on, um, spending time with your family, etc. And it came to the point where I was just like, man, like there's a lot of things going on in the world today. And oftentimes on social media, um, especially nowadays, you know, we want to highlight, you know, the things that are wrong with our community. And I think the, the basis of this platform was always um positivity right i'm um, putting things out there that can uplift our community to new heights and and i just feel like the the theme that you've kind of brought with uh, you know working within an organization such as that is um let's try to focus on the things that you know that do uplift our community there are so many people out there um, I feel like one of our biggest, I wouldn't say problems, but like something that we could work on as a people is um, we we are so humble to a point that, you know, sometimes if you were to share your story, like it could be for the benefit of thousands or whoever sees your story. Right. And so um, we we kind of overstate how humble we are. And so um, I just feel like, you know, share like the, the best feeling you could do is you know share your story and then a few years down the road someone stops you say hey i saw your episode i saw this or i saw that and because of it you know it helped me get to a different point in my life where i'm more successful and so that's that's kind of been really humbling to me to even see like people who are like willing to react to any type of content i put out there it's like i'm i'm a nobody in my own eyes but um i think the, the bigger goal is just trying to do something um, inspiring, influential, and just positive altogether, I guess. No, and I'm a big fan. Uh, I won't lie. Uh, I'm really close uh, with Big Buddha, and so we've always had um, the idea of doing something similar, right? But the difference is, is someone that actually puts it into action. And so, you know, proud of you taking that step. Uh, it's a platform that is needed where our Pacific Islanders can tell their stories, right? We all have a unique story to tell. And uh, a lot of times the goal is to get from point A to point B, but there's a lot of zigzags from there. And so essentially just being able to share that so others can can build and learn from that. One thing I've also learned though, um, is, is, you know, with, with regards to the uplift, uplifting part, is that there's no mistake that we or your child can make that no one can ever overcome. Right. And that's the one thing is a lot of times someone makes a mistake. It's not the end of the world. Um, and so that's the one thing is that great, grateful for, you know, forgiveness and the atonement of Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, that can allow us uh, the benefit to be able to to move forward um, and understand that none of us are perfect. OK, so in closing, um, I think uh, my only thing would be to you is. Uh, the question I usually ask a lot of athletes is, um, given that someone were in the same shoes as you, what would you tell them, right? And so uh, maybe I would like to pin that question on you. Um, maybe you do have someone who's a convicted felon or this or that. Um, what would you say to them if they were looking at the uphill battle and kind of feel, you know, hopeless? Yeah. Um, first speaking to the youth, right? I, I would say that there are three pearls of wisdom that I can offer. First of all, listen to your parents, right? We don't realize, like I thought when I was 17 years old that my parents were, were old and they didn't understand. My mom and dad knew exactly what I was going through. And they were just there less than 20 years before I was, right? Secondly, pick the right friends, right? Pick friends that are going to uplift you. Um, 
I, I, I went to a fireside where Reno spoke and Reno said, you know, your ecosystem or your friends are like a garden. And are you going to have roses in that garden uh, or are you going to have weeds? And the minute you let one weed in, it contaminates that entire garden. Right. Um, and the last point of advice that I would have is don't be ashamed to step step out of your comfort zone. Um, what I mean by that is when I was in high school, I tried to appease my friends too much. And I had an opportunity to do honors classes and do AP classes and do well. But then I was being told that I was being fiat balang, right? And so I, I, I kind of lowered my own standard just to appease to those that my parents had consulted in saying that they weren't the roses in, in my garden. And so those are the three things that I would highly advise the teenagers. Now, anyone else that has made mistakes in the past that are trying to get into the workforce, um, I would advise you hit that head on, um, share that on the front end and and be very transparent as to what you've learned and how that's made you a better person um, and how that's going to make you a better employee. And uh, you don't realize that how much of a difference that that's going to make um, in telling your future employer the impact that you can have within their business. And that's I think that's uh, great advice. I think, uh, you know, in in closing, um, I, I, you know, oftentimes I sit here and think, um, you know, something that resonated with me that you said was like the fear of Balangi part. You know what I mean? Um, I think one reason why it sits with me is because, you know, the area I grew up in, in Sandy, you know, I, I talked with um, Dana about this, right? Um, our youth was very close knit, but um, the one thing we always felt was, you know, we, when we go around Tongans from, you know, Salt Lake, you know, we, we often felt like we didn't belong, right? And then when we would hang out with Balangi people or people who we grew up around with in Sandy, um, we also didn't feel like we belong, right? And so we're kind of like in the middle, like trying to figure out who we are in terms of identity. And like when people say like Fie Balangi, I think like for me, it, it's, it's hard, you know, trying to navigate something like that. But at the same time, um, there's like a culture within our culture that says like being Tongan is like being hard, not showing emotion. Being Tongan is, you know, um, just being a great athlete. It doesn't like highlight um, how many intellects we have within our community. It doesn't highlight like all the great things about being um, a Polynesian in a sense, you know. And I think going against the grain in terms of those things um, we as a people should probably, you know, promote those things more, not only like from the parent side, but like kids side, you know what I mean? Um, we like Donna brought this up, which I thought was really cool. Um, a lot of Polynesian athletes, especially football players, they kind of take pride in, in being the hardest hitter on the, on the football team. Right. It's like, but not enough of them take pride as being the smartest player on the football team. He's like, so there needs to be kind of a culture change in terms of why not be both, right? Why not be the hardest hitter, the most athletic, and be the smartest? Now, that sounds very ambitious and like, but I think it's something, you know, not only we're capable, but everyone's capable of. And so kind of like breaking down those uh, walls in terms of um, we're very one-sided and just being open for growth. And so... Um, before we close, do you want to um, add anything on to what I just said? No, no. I Honestly, um, one pearl of wisdom that, that I would leave for anyone in the audience. And, and I was just thinking out loud when you were talking about Fiat Balangi or just learning from, from the past. Um, our parents came from the islands and they did as best as they could. Yeah. Right. And so I remember growing up, anytime my parents would ask questions, I never made eye contact never responded you know um i humbly accepted um and they came down with a heavy hand and that was all that they knew right mm -hmm. because that's what they were taught in tonga um and i think we today um can learn from that and when we parent and i'm not a parenting expert but one thing i have learned is that we can have open dialogue with our kids um it's okay for our kids to make eye contact because that's 
you know, what we do in, in, uh, in mainstream America. Now, I remember when I went to college, like I didn't ask questions because I was taught not to. And I realized that those students that wanted to be the smartest were the ones that were asking questions. Right. And so there are things that we can iterate on and, and learn from and grow from. And so, but take the good parts of our culture, which there is so much <laughs> and enrich the lives of others. And then also take the parts that we can improve on and, uh, and build upon that. But, uh, man, really grateful for the opportunity and proud of what you're doing and all the guests that you've had on here. Um, and, and hopefully somebody can learn from my story, uh, even though, uh, it's, it's not one that I would, uh, recommend. Um, but every step of the way, just burn your canoe and make sure that you conquer every Island that you land on. Thank you, Shana, for coming on. Uh, and that's it folks.